So here's the first one that's come and due. Um, it's a uniaxial problem. Um, so it's uh, one dimensional loading on a post there. And what do we want to do here? We want to find the normal stress and shear stress on plane AB. That's one thing we want to do. And the other thing we want to do is find the maximum normal stress and maximum shear stress acting anywhere in the column. All right, so why don't we start with the maximums. Um, so if here's our column, and then we put this load on here, if we want to find sigma max, what plane would that um, stress act on, sigma max? Sure. Yeah, no, that's sigma is normal stress. So, so what plane would, would the maximum normal stress act on? Yeah, just a straight up plane, right? Not, nothing fancy here. So I, I'm, I go over this sometimes because um, sometimes when we start doing all the fancy equations, so we, we just want to keep grounded and you know, just be sure we don't count what the heck's going on here. Okay, so the maximum normal stress, we're not talking rocket science or anything like that. We're just talking like what we were talking about all term right there. Okay, and if you calculate that, what is the maximum normal stress on that plane? You take the load, and what do you do with it? Just a straight up area, right? I mean, that, that's all, and we've been doing that all term, right? No, no big deal, okay? Now, and so that's tau max, okay? So you just take the load, and you divide it by the cross-sectional area, and you're done, all right? That's all there is to it. Now, the cross-sectional area on this thing, of course, is uh, 25 square inches, because it's five by five. And all of the equations and everything that you do with uniaxial is based on that area, okay? Because they don't, the whole purpose of having these equations is so you don't have to do a bunch of trig and calculate areas and angles and all that. You know, you just find the standard cross-sectional area, that, that's what goes into every formula for uniaxial, okay? 25 will go into every formula. All right? Now, how about... Um, how about tau max? Which which plane or planes does tau max act on? Yeah, which what where, where's the plane? Like what angle or what's going on? Side to side? side, to side? Yeah. Like horizontal or? Yeah. No, it's so not. What's the opposite? Like what angle? If you were to give it a numerical angle, what plane does the maximum shear act at? Yeah, 45s. Okay, now there's two possibilities, okay? See, one of them runs across like that, and I'll do the best with that I can. There we go. Okay, like that, and that would be 45 degrees. All right. And then the other one, I'm going to run out of room here. Let's see if I can get away with this. Can I get away with this? Maybe. There's a chance I might be able to do this. I don't know. Okay, it's not red. It must be here, huh? Yeah, purple. There we go. Oh yeah, that's it. All right. So, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna make this thing bigger so I got a little bit more room to work. Okay. So tau max. I'll put it right there. Okay. All right. Now what tau max equals is plus or minus p over two a. Right. It's half of the maximum normal stress. Is what it is. Okay, so one of them's right there, and the other one's here. And, yeah, I'm not going to be able to draw this one too well, I'm afraid. Um, that's actually going to be at 135 degrees, okay? Or actually, I'm going to do it as a negative 45. I'll just bring it off that other plane. And I can't do much hatching on that just because it just happens, the angle I'm drawing at. You know, there's no face showing. I mean, yeah, I'm doing a oblique kind of sketch there. So here's the other tau max, okay? So there's two of them. One of them's positive um, p over 2a, and the other one is negative p over 2a, right? So those are the two planes that the maximum shears act on. All right, now if I take this top one off, and let's kind of get that more into a 2D mode. 
if I'm pushing this load down, I'm thinking the shear is going to do that. Is that a fair assumption there, would you say? And then if I pull this other one off in a 2D, 2D mode, and I'm kind of doing a little bit of drafting here. You all with me there? I'm going from that 3D oblique to a 2D looking for, straight at it. You know, you good? Okay. If I push this load down, that shear is probably going to do something like that. Is that, is that fair? Okay. What's going on there? All right. Um, so if that's the case, the top one here, positive or negative shear? Yeah, that's going to be negative because that's clockwise, right? Y'all good? If I kind of take a, a book and I put it up against the wall and I push on it like what I'm showing there, that thing's going to go clockwise, right? Negative, okay? So this is negative. Um, so this one is, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little messy here, negative P over 2A. And then the other one, if I apply this one, what do you suppose this one's going to be? That one being negative, process of elimination, positive, right? Okay, so what's going on there? So I hold that book against the wall and I push on it like that, it goes counterclockwise, okay? So that's that's positive, okay? So, so the, that's the maximum and minimum stresses that are going on in that column. All right, we, we okay with that stuff? Okay. And, and, and there's infinite number of planes in there. Every little plane has its own little stress on it. You know, that, that's what's going on there. And they're all happening at once. Okay. And you can look at any plane you want and do the, apply the equations which are an expression of equilibrium, you know, and figure out what the stresses are on that plane. All right. So we good on that for starters. And you know what? I kind of drew those angles in incorrectly. And I'm sorry. I, 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 just because what I'm going to do next, I want to be sure I'm getting that right. There we go. That's the angle. Because the angle, by definition, is from the standard cross-sectional plane. So I was kind of thinking biaxial there. But I better go uniaxial on this. So this one would be right here is where it would be. Sorry about that. That's really how I ought to reference those to be correct and theoretical and all that. There we go. Okay. So, so we all right with that? So the max are just plus or minus P over 2A for the tau and P over A for sigma. Okay. All right. Now, given what I just, how I had to change those angles because I was a little careless in how I drew those, um, what you're going to do for the next bit is you're going to use those standard formulas. All right. The, um, the formulas for Sigma at a given angle for uniaxial is what is that formula? P over Yeah, okay, so which so it looks like that. All right. And that and that'll be over A and then tau at a given angle. And I just pulled up formula 21. Here's formula 22 is minus p sine 2 theta over uh, 2a, okay? All right, so those are the formulas. Now, we got to be kind of careful when we're doing this. Um, for starters, what number will you put in for p to get this, this kind of right and conscientiously plugging in all the stuff right? What number is going to go in for P? Yeah. Be the 6,000. Is it just 6,000 or hint, do we have to do something else to that 6,000? We got to put a negative out in front of it, right? Because it's compressive, okay? So we, that technically that number goes in as negative 6,000, okay? And, and these are little details. They, they matter, frankly, a lot more on biaxial, but I just want to get you in the habit of, of paying attention to this stuff, okay? Now the other thing, okay, now what's the angle going to be? Yeah, it's not it's not 26. That's the trick on that. See, because you can you can dimension the thing any way you want, but you got to define it in the same way it was done in the formula. And in the formula derivation, you define the angle from the standard cross-sectional plane. Okay, and so it's not 26. It's 64 because 90 minus 26 is 64. And what do I got to do to that 64? Do you suppose? Yeah, I got to put make a negative because it's clockwise. All right. So all these little things, they're just little details, and they're, they're not like, you know, it's not like some big theoretical thing. It's just someone, when they did that formula, 
100 years ago just decided here's how, here's how I'm going to set it up okay these are the conventions I'm going to use and and when you do this you got to be conscientious just about how you apply that stuff okay so so positive for tension for the force positive tension negative compression for the angle it's from the standard cross sectional plane uh, counterclockwise positive clockwise negative okay so that's how it goes in for uniaxial. So just plug all that stuff in as shown, and then just run the numbers, you know, and you can get the get the answers. There's not much to it. So we doing all right with that? We got any questions on that? One? Now the next one is a little. Tricky, maybe. I don't know. This is still so little tricky. Um, okay, on the next one there, we've got this. Uh, we've got a water tank, and I kind of show you a little 3D sketch there down below. Water tank on a square column. So we're given that this the column is square, and we're given allowable values. Okay, so this is how much that material that the column is made of can handle safely. Okay. And they took it into a lab and tested it and came up with it. Now, one little hint I'll give you on this is the lab just tested the material. They have no idea what you're going to do with the material, and they don't care. All right, They're just testing it. And they ran three tests on it, one for compression, one for tension, and one for shear. And that's the numbers they came up with. Okay, So now it's up to you to use those numbers for what you're going to design. That's, that's how this works. Okay? All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to find the volume of the tank. And what we know is that water at a normal temperature weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Okay. Now, I give you some of these in metrics, but I give you a lot in English because if you're working in America, you're going to be using the English system for structural still. We're still not on the metric system. Okay, so get used to that. Um, and get used to, you know, 62.4, that's a good unit weight of water. Now that's the amount, that's how much the water weighs. Now the tank itself weighs 6,200, right? So we got to add that in there. What I'm doing, I'm coming up with the load. See, I'm coming up with what P is. So P is equal to this stuff. Okay. Now that's the weight of the stuff, but now we've got a safety factor right there. So I think what you're going to want to do is, is normally on a safety factor, I apply it to the load. Okay. So instead of designing it for the actual weight, the water and the weight of the tank, to be safe, I'm going to design it for one and a half times that. That's what a safety factor is. And generally the way that's applied is you apply it to the load. So I'm going to design this for one and a half times what I think it's actually going to have to carry. And you know that's how I'm being safe so it doesn't fail or anything. All right, and if you do that, you ought to come up with something on the order of 171,000 pounds, I think something like that. So you're going to design this column for 171,000 pounds. All right. Now we got to design it and we got to check it for three things. Okay, and they're listed there. We got to check it for the compressive stress, the tensile stress, and the shear stress. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a column and I'm going to put that load on it, okay? And I'm going to put the 171,000 pounds on it, and I want to make sure the column is big enough so that it doesn't too doesn't have too much stress in it. Okay, that, that's that's the deal here. All right. Now I'm going to I need to consider three things. I need to consider compression. And I need to consider tension, and I need to consider shear. Okay. So if I do this, do, will there be compression in that column? Do you think? I push down. Yeah, I think so, and I think that's pretty obvious there. Yeah. Is there going to be tension in that column? No. Okay. I'm not. I'm pushing on it. I think any angle you look at, any of those infinite number of planes, they're all going to be in compression. There's nothing going on there to pull it. It's being compressed. Okay. So I don't need to worry about that, okay? Y'all good there? 
See, these, the people who design this material, they don't know what I'm going to do with it. They, again, they, it's not their business. They don't care. They're just going to sell it to me. That's what, they're, that's what they want to do. Okay? And they want to give me an accurate description of what it can do. But I don't really care what it does intention because this thing isn't going to be intention, at least for a simple design I'm doing. Now, of course, in the world of earthquakes and all that, you know, yeah, I'd probably be looking at that. But in our simple model here, no. Okay. All right. Now, how about shear? Is there going to be shear on that thing? Yeah, now what, what, what angle What angle is the shear going to be biggest at? Yeah, okay. Now that's, and you see, and what am I trying to say? But this is what you got to get used to when you start doing this angle stuff. So you get to pick up all these weird stresses at different angles. It's we're, we're getting out of what we did at the beginning of the term. It's not just like I apply that and it's compression and I'm done. It's not that simple anymore, okay? That's, that's kind of the page we're turning here when we get into this stuff. When you look at different angle planes, you pick up different kinds of stresses now. So it's not it's not simple anymore. It's more complex. Okay. Now we don't pick up any tension. We don't got to worry about that because we're pushing on it. It's not going to have any tensile loads. But we do have to worry about shear. So we got to look at that. Okay. Okay. Now what's the now how do we calculate the maximum compression? What, what's the design stress there we're going to have? Yeah, P over A, right? And how about for uh, tau, what's the formula we're going to use? Yeah, P over 2A, all right? So now, it's we're just applying those formulas. There's nothing much to it. The, the difference here is that you're calculating area now. You're not calculating stress. You've got stress. You, you need to back into area, all right, is what you need to do. So what we got here is we got sigma max. Let's look at one of these with you, is P over A. I'm interested in the area, so if I solve for the area, it's going to be P over sigma max, right? And I got P, and that's 171,000 roughly pounds. And then I've got sigma, uh, the maximum compressive stress, the allowable, you call it. See, that's pounds per inch squared, so when I go ahead and run that, I'm going to get 47.5 square inches. So that column has to be 47.5 square inches if it is the um, maximum compressive stress I'd assume that I would have there would be uh, 3,600 pounds per square inch. Okay? So I'm just solving that and backing into what the, what the area has to be. And if the area has to be 47, what do the sides have to be? So the area is 47.5 inches squared. Square column, square root, that's, that's where that word comes from. Yeah, 6.9. Okay, now let's take one step into the real world. Are we going to design a column 6.9 by 6.9 inches? We're probably not going to do that, are we? Um, we're going to round it at least up to the nearest inch. Now, that gets us to 7 inches. Now, let, we'll take it that far in this class because i got to kind of standardize it so people, you know, I get the same answers from everybody. But in the real world, I'm not going to design a 7-inch column either because carpenters are going to get mad at me, right? Because the, the wood ain't going to work, okay? So, yeah, we just want to start thinking about that stuff, right? Kind of 7 inches is a very odd dimension. You know, if you look at, like, stud spacings and stuff like that, those are done so that normal lengths of wood come out even, right? I mean, that, that's kind of how it's done. So, you know, in the real world, I'd probably look at 8 or something like that. But, but we'll, we'll just go 7 for this class because, you know, just... It gets too confusing when 36 people turn in homework and I give complicated instructions. So just round up to the next inch. But now, now we also have to look at the uh, shear. Okay. So look, get get look at both cases. Round up to the nearest inch and then pick the biggest or the smallest. What? Yeah, I think the biggest. There we go. Yeah, and, and okay. So when we're doing design work, we pick the biggest size. If we do multiple iterations of, you know, looking at different things, we pick the biggest size because that's the safest. Or if we're doing it the other way and doing loads, we pick the smallest load. So you pick the biggest size or the smallest load when you're doing design. Okay. So so have a look at that and see how that comes out. Okay. And pick the biggest one, round up to the nearest inch, and that's how big the column needs to be. All right. And you know, just keep in mind when you start working that whole other aspect of engineering. I mean, I'd, I'd say half of what I know about civil engineering I learned from people with a high school education that had been 
working with dirt and pipes their whole lives, and they were they knew an awful lot about dirt and pipes. Okay, more than you could possibly imagine. And I learned. I know about ten percent of what they know, because because I talked to them. Okay, so you know that that's a whole other aspect of this field that you, you really don't learn in school. You, you, you talk to carpenters and you talk to people that rake pipes and you do all that stuff and you learn. And you come in there prepared to put up with some. Uh, they'll 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 ride you a little bit. But that's okay. That's just how it works. <coughs> Okay, let's have a look at the biaxial stuff. Now, the biaxial stuff, um, it's just this long series of running numbers, okay? Um, so, you just it's just a process is really what it is, and you just want to get used to doing the process. I gave you two of them to do, 191 and 192. Um, you know, and really, they're, they're quite similar to one another. They're just doing the same process twice. I mean, you know, that's about all there is to it. Um, I don't know, do, do you guys want to look at one of these? We could look at one of these. Yeah, okay, why don't we just walk through one of these, okay? All right. So the first thing you do, let's look at 191, and you know, I don't see a reference. If you have a preference, I'll look at one or the other, but again, they're, they're pretty much the same thing twice. Okay, you, you take a look at them, and what you want to do is identify the inputs, okay? So the inputs are the sigma x right there, sigma y right there, and then tau xy, which is this one on the vertical plane. That's the one you use. Okay. Those are the things you look at. You write them down. You, you, the only thing to really concern yourself with here on this is the sign. So that's a compression, compressive 18,000, 18, so it goes in as negative 18,000. This is a compressive 4,000, so it goes in as negative 4,000. This one, as we've been talking about, if you hold a book up against the wall, push on it that way, the thing will rotate counterclockwise, so that's positive 2,000. Okay. All right, the other thing to get there is the angle. Now, by convention, and again, nothing magic about this, it's just whoever made up the equation referenced it this way 150 years ago. So, what you do is you start at the vertical plane for biaxial, positive is counterclockwise. So that 30 degree angle, we don't use it, okay? It's, it, it, it shows where the plane is, but it's not the angle they chose to use in the formula. They use the 60 counterclockwise positive, so it's a positive 60. I just go ahead and write down 2 theta, because that's what goes in the equations. That's 120. Right. And that's really the, the lion's share of the work right there, is writing that stuff down. You've got a bunch of calculations to do. Um, just plug it into that formula. Okay, now that's formula um, 25. Okay, and you just plug it into it. I, again, I, I forgot to check in Moodle, but I'm pretty sure I've got a spreadsheet there that you can just download that will do this for you if you want. You just plug the numbers in and the angles, run the numbers, and I get negative 5768. Okay. So that's the uh, stress on the 60 degree plane. So what I'm doing is I've got those stresses in the x and y directions. Those are givens. Okay, in in the working world, you'd have ways of calculating those for a given design situation. What I want to know is what's happening on that hatched plane. For whatever reason, I want to know that. Okay, and so that plane is at the angle shown. I need to figure out what the stresses are on that little, or excuse me, that little element. I should say that element two planes, AB and BC. So what I just found is what's happening at AB, the stress on that plane. Okay. Now I can find the other stress um, two ways. One way I can do it is I can find the angle to the plane BC. I just did AB, now I'm going to do BC. That's 90 degrees further than AB is, so it's 60 plus 90 gets me 150, double it, I get 300. All right.
right? So instead of using uh, 60 and doubling it and getting 120, now I take 150, double it and get 300, plug it in, and I'll get negative 16,232. Now, that's one way to do it. And what that is, is sigma x1 at 150 degrees. That's how I would reference that. Now, there's also a little bit of a shortcut I can use on equation 31, where if I take sigma x plus sigma y, which are givens, they should equal the sum of sigma x1 and sigma y1. Okay? I've already just, I just found sigma x1 on the previous slide. It's five, seven, negative 5768. So if I take sigma x plus sigma y minus sigma x1, I'll get sigma y1, and that's negative 16,232. Same answer is up above. You can do it either way. Okay. So if I got my spreadsheet, I just keep the numbers in there and would put, thir uh, put I'm sorry, 150 into that thing, and I'd get this answer to pop right out. And if I'm doing it by hand, I gen generally use this because it's, it's quicker and easier. Okay. So either way, you can come up with that stress on the second plane. It's negative 16,232. Are we doing all right with that? Any questions on that? I mean, you just, you just get those values and plug them in. I mean, that's really about it. Just, just want you to understand kind of what you're doing and what you're finding. You're finding the stresses on that element there. That's what you're doing. The two planes on it. There's a shear stress to find also. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and do that too. And there's a separate formula for that. It's formula 26. And I just plug into formula 26. The same values that I started with. I'll use that 60 degrees for the plane AB. And this will find me the shear on plane AB is what it will find me. Okay. Because the plane AB is at 60 degrees. See, that's what's going on. All right. So I just run those numbers, and I get the shear stress on that. It's positive. It comes out positive 5,062 psi. Yeah, question there. How do you know whether the 2,000 psi applies to tau x, y, or y, x? Um, it applies to both. Okay, so the 2,000 is purposely put in the corner where the arrowheads meet because its magnitude applies to both. I don't put signs on those because I, I just use the direction of the arrows for the signs. So I just, that's a good question, so I'm just going to follow it through. So tau x, y is this one. That's positive 2,000. Oh. Tau y, x is that one, and that's negative 2,000. Oh, that's yeah. yeah, right. That's the whole equilibrium thing, right? The shears on those 90-degree planes are always equal in magnitude, opposite, and sign. Yeah. So I just put one number in the corner where the arrowheads meet. That's how I do that. Okay. All right. All right, and then there's a sketch of what's going on. So if I want to get an idea of what's happening here, that, that's what's happening right there. On plane AB, I've got negative 5768. On plane BC, I've got negative 16232. And the shear there on the 60 degree plane is positive 5062. So positive would rotate that element counterclockwise that would be the case for either of these they, they both rotate counterclockwise the 90 degree planes from that plane bc would be negative same magnitude though 5062 so do include a sketch on your on your homework there you know when you turn it in okay. I, I can't remember i might have put a little box here to do it on there. Okay. So it's right there to go. Get to go. Okay. all right and, and so that's basically what this stuff is. It's, again, we're getting a little bit more complicated than we did earlier. We're now we're starting to look at different angles. And with the equilibrium derivation here, we've come up with formulas to find the stresses on those different planes. Okay.
questions on that? So up at the top, just list you know the givens, sigma x, sigma y, tau x, y, and the angle. Um, run through the formulas. If you're using a spreadsheet, just note that on your homework, you know, done by spreadsheet. Um, and then give me a sketch too. I want a sketch because I want to be sure you can visualize what this means, what, what's happening. Okay. So we all right with that? We good? Good to go. Okay, um, so that's the starting point on biaxial right there. Um, now there's a bit more to do with it though, so let's kind of keep going. So let's uh, let's kind of have a look at the next bit on this. So the next bit are what are called principal stresses. Okay. Now what's going to happen here is we have all these different stresses at different angles that uh, vary, okay, and, and they're all a little different. So what we're going to have to do here is identify what the largest stresses are because that's what we have to design for. Not Maybe not always, but very often we're interested in what the biggest stresses are. So that's the next thing we want to look at is identifying the largest stresses that occur in, a, in an object. Okay. So that's the next thing we're going to look at. So we got more of these kind of crazy equations coming our way here, okay? So, let's see here. All right, so why don't we find the axial and shear stress on this plane? And you know, I don't think I've got this in there, so you might need just to sketch this thing up. So this might be, you know, a good bit of practice here. Just spend uh, five minutes or so and see if you can figure that out. So what what's the stress on plane AB? And I've got the equations there for you to use. I don't know if I've got this. I don't think this is in your book.
Then we can start right to the equation. It's about it. So notice in your homework, I said find the uh, stresses on an element. Now I'm saying find the stress on a plane. It's the same equation, same thing. It's just instead of finding two sets of stresses, we just find one. That's all. What, what you're doing might depend on your design situation and what you want to know. Those are the values, I think, that go in. You all got those? How about the angle? What are we after there? 120? It'd be positive because it's counterclockwise off that vertical plane. Okay. And I just double it, you know, because that's what goes in the formula. You okay with that? Any questions on that? I mean, that's that's the big part of it right there. It's just doing that. Okay. We just plug it in. After that, we, we good? All right. Okay. Okay, we're doing all right. Now, just have a look at this. See, if, um, if you just looked at the top and you're going, okay, I need to design that. What what I would look at what I would look at that thing and do is I go, okay, um, I got to design it for 310, right? That's that's the tensile stress I have to design this thing for. But is that going to do it? Gonna do it, is it okay? 
So this is one of the big aspects of this biaxial stuff, see. You just don't design for the biggest XY stress. You got to go inside at all the different angles and look at them and find where the biggest stress is and what it is, see. It's not 310. We've just done a, a, an angle in there for plane AB, and it's at least 387. And if we do 121 degrees, it might be bigger yet. I, I don't know, okay? So the next step on this biaxial stuff is you got to figure out what the biggest overall stress is. If you've got a material that acts pretty much the same way in all directions, you've got, this will be your design value, is finding out the maximum stress that occurs in that element, all right? And, and you have to do that to, to, um, to go in there and look at and investigate that. You can't just rely on X, as sigma X or sigma Y as being the design stress. There might very well, very likely will be one inside that's bigger yet, okay? So, so we want to figure out what that biggest stress is and where it is so we can design properly. Because if I just design this thing for 310, you know, that's not, that's not it. It's, it's at least that big and probably bigger, okay? Right? So that's one of the big significant parts of this biaxial stuff. That, that we deal with. And I, I've read a little bit about the Industrial Revolution, you know, when that made all this uh, mass production of, of iron and steel possible. And, you know, I, I think I remember reading, uh, you know, at some point designers were doing this stuff and they started seeing these cracks appearing at these odd angles and they didn't know what the heck was going on. You know, they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't anticipate this, okay? So they started investigating it and coming up with some of this theory to explain what was happening to these structures they were making. Okay? All right, so sigma x1, 120 is bigger than the sigma y. So the tensile stress on plane AB is greater than the largest applied tensile stress, okay? So, so that's, that's kind of the issue here, is, is dealing with that. Um, now, let's just, let's just realize that uniaxial is a special case of biaxial. So let's kind of have a look here at this little thing we drew up. It was a little while ago when we did uniaxial. I don't remember what page it's on, but it's somewhere. It's 292. And see, uniaxial is, is a special case of biaxial. So let's have a look at this, kind of in anticipation of all this uh, calculation we're going to do, and, and just to kind of get some uh, reference to it and, and a way to visualize what's going on. Okay. So here's the sketch, and here's the conclusions that I can draw. Sigma max and sigma min are 90 degrees apart, okay? This is going to hold for biaxial too. See, here's sigma max at the standard cross-sectional plane. There's sigma min 90 degrees off of that. And that kind of makes sense in a way, right? I mean, there's an intuition, at least for me, for that statement, that the max and min normal stresses are 90 degrees apart. The other thing that, again, I, kind of makes a little bit of intuitive sense to me is that the shear on those planes is zero. There's no shear on those planes. It's just a straight pole, or as the case of the men, it's a lack of a pole. Okay. So when you've got a, just a straight uh, compression or tension, which gets you a sigma max and sigma min on these uniaxial bars, there, there's no shear on those planes. All right, now tau max acts in the middle between sigma max and min. So tau max is 45 degrees from the sigma max plane, okay? It's midway between sigma max and min. That makes a certain amount of sense to me. And the last thing is that the sigma on the tau max planes is uh, the average normal stress. Okay. And see, tau max is midway between sigma max and min. So as it happens on that plane, the sigma is the average midway between sigma max and sigma min. Okay, makes sense. Okay. 
So I think this stuff's a little bit easier to see with uniaxial, and, and hopefully it makes some, some amount of intuitive sense. And these, these apply to biaxial too. We'll, next time we'll go through all the calculations and come up with the formulas, but this is kind of the, a lot of the important points of it, okay?